I first heard about this whole world through a podcast where Dr. Diane Hennessy Powell was featured talking about the work she'd previously done testing non-speakers with autism and finding that they could seemingly read their parents' or teacher's mind, and she would put a partition up, the parent would be on one side or the teacher, whoever, and was being shown a number, a word, a fake word. And on the other side of the partition, the non-speaker was able to accurately and and very, very high accuracy, like above 97% um, type what the person was seeing. And she done multiple tests and, you know, she had been educated at Harvard and, you know, Johns Hopkins. I mean, or, she, you know, Johns Hopkins was where she was educated. She taught at Harvard like she was a real scientist. <laughs> and I was fascinated. So, you know, I contacted her and she introduced me to a fresh family, so someone she had never tested before. And I was very skeptical and wanted to really kind of be in charge of the test. I found the space. I booked the crew. I bought the cues. I set up, you know, downloaded the random number generator. And we did the first test and it was mind boggling. And this was a new speller that we were testing. So she was still in the phase of spelling where she had to have a little bit of touches on her shoulder, her head. And I don't think anyone in the room would say, oh, yeah, the, there was Morse code happening between someone and her. But Dr. Powell was like, it will never hold up for science just because of the touch. So go see this other young individual who's not touched at all. Can Akeel. Type, Akeel. Mm -hmm who can spell independently into a iPad across the room. Or, and after seeing that, I think I my mind was absolutely blown wide open. So I started reaching out to families and putting up my own inquiries around the internet and, um, and just diving deep into this and finding there had been many books written about this. And they were, you know, not very popular on Amazon because, you know, no one really knew about this um, – this phenomenon, but there had been many, many books. There had been articles. This has been reported for a long time. Um, I was introduced to a teacher in Wisconsin who had been videotaping this phenomenon 30 years ago, sending out VHS tapes to, you know, scientists saying, can you please look at this? These children are able to accurately tell you what word I put on a Scrabble board from a different room. If I hold a color over their head, they can tell you what it is. And, um, and so I thought, my gosh, this is happening all over. It's just no one's like really put the dots together. And then I think, you know, as you start to meet families and teachers who are experiencing this and kind of start to build trust, then they opened up their world further and further until I started realizing this is in England, this is in Israel, this is in India, this is in Africa, this is in Mexico. It was all over and it's widespread and I think for me, when I started really talking to a lot of in teachers and spelling communication partners who work with non-speaking individuals, almost every single one of them said, look, if you work with this population, you know this, it's just the best kept secret because it, who is going to believe it? <laughs> it's so hard to believe. And so many of the families who have a non-speaker are already fighting a war on so many fronts like just just for time, for care, for caregiving support, for respite care, for spelling to be legitimized in school, to have the assistance their kids need, their siblings need, that it's just like bring telepathy into the mix, forget it. And um, and I think it really became a love army. I mean, really, of like kind of building this world and, and everyone meeting each other and realizing their strength in numbers and then letting this thing launch. You guys have done some studies recently that you haven't talked about. Would you like to hint at that just a, a yeah. bit? Because I think when people first initially see the videos of you doing these studies with mm -hmm. Akil or any of the other individuals, uh, I mean, it's tough to think there's an inherent innocence there, like yeah. that anything would be contrived. But there is that back part of our mind that is skeptical of Always. like, maybe something's happening. There's some cueing, subconscious cueing, or who knows how it could happen. But lots of magic tricks happen that we don't know how they how they unfold. Yeah. And uh and so I think taking this even deeper on the scientific side to be able to really do these studies um, brings it to that point where it's self-evident. So yeah, yeah, you know, absolutely. Share. So after the telepathy tapes, we you know we started making the documentary film, which was kind of always the point <laughs> it was to do documentary film first, but then the podcast came first, and it worked out how it should. But so we are really. Um, deep into filming the documentary film. It's almost like production will be wrapped in August, which is exciting. And of course, we're following the storylines of some of these beautiful individuals and their families, but of course, the science storyline too. Um, there was a QEG specialist named Jeff Tarrant, and he witnessed the first few studies we did with Dr. Powell 
they even did their own studies when I wasn't there. I was filming other stuff. And he was just like, holy shit. <laughs> I mean, what is happening here? So after what, after he saw what he saw, he kind of went on his own to try to innovate like a, a different brain scanning software with a built-in letter board that you could separate a parent and a, a student. And, and I think for him, or, you know, a parent and a, and a child or whoever the telepathic pair was. So he really started innovating this, but you know he also realized in order to really get the science accredited, you had to work with like another. He had to work with another neuroscientist, and best if it's not Dr. Powell, right? It should be someone peer reviewing and repeating. So we were being um, contacted by numerous neuroscientists after the telepathy tapes came out, and and we started talking to some of them. And there was a woman named Dr. Julia Mossbridge who I really liked her ethos, you know, and I think she presumed competence, which was really important and understood these were individuals. And so she was like, I would love to get in touch with, a, you know, maybe a teacher who has access to a lot of non-speakers and start doing some tests on my own, which is always scary because I'm like, I don't know who this woman is. I mean, she could be working for the CIA for right. all I know. Like, you know, you never know. But she seemed wonderful and, and, and her past work was brilliant. And so it was like, okay, you know, just take a deep breath and just, okay, let science do its thing. And I just stayed out of it. These weren't individuals I've ever tested. And, you know, Dr. Mossberg started reporting back from the field, like, Kai, we have a non-speaker and their communication partner in one room, another non-speaker and their communication partner in another room. No walls are touching. There's no audio. There's no way that this, there could be anything. And she's like, and instead of just showing them numbers or words like you were, I'm trying to test some wisdom and show a video. And like the first video she showed a non-speaker, I think was of that Coco, the gorilla that learned sign language. Mm. And in the other room, the other non-speaker started saying, like, I see a pet and it looks hairy. It's kind of human-like. It's a primate and it seems to know language. I mean, it was just like there's no, it was the 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 statistical opportunity for that to be chance is nil. And um, and then they repeated it. And then the non-speakers got a little dysregulated and they were done. And so I remember getting that phone call a few months ago that they did it twice in a row. And I was like, that's huge. And I was like, can you repeat it? <laughs> And try it with other kids. And the teacher this morning called me and said, I don't know if you've talked to Dr. Mossberg, but we've been doing more tests and we've repeated it over and over and over again with multiple kids from different rooms, not just validating the telepathy, but validating the authorship that they are writing. These are their words. And and I mean, I got that call this morning, which is so serendipitous that I'm here. And I mean, I just start crying because it's like all the families, all these teachers, everyone knows it. And I think the skepticism of like, of course, that's to be, you know, it's going to happen, of course, but I think was very harmful to some of the families who already have felt traumatized and not believed and to have the world being like, oh, we think you're faking these tests or like making it up, non-speaking individuals who have nothing to gain, you know, and their families who are just fighting tooth and nail every day to have a normal existence, like aren't making it up, but to have that scientific validation is just everything. So... Now they were like, okay, you can come film it. And so that was the next big question is like, if we bring cameras into the room and people into the room, how is this going to change it? But for science, it, it's it's kind of over because now other scientists can come watch. Anyone can come validate this. I mean, it's they're doing it. But um, yeah, I mean, I want to film it big time. So <laughs> yeah, that's our goal in August. We're living amidst a cultural revolution and evolution and paradigm and in our perception of consciousness. And uh, we can get into theories about all this, but just to make this again, just to reiterate it, these are various different studies you're doing, whether you're showing Uno cards, numbers on a screen, words that are, or a video in certain cases that are exposed to the child's ter- uh, caretaker. Um, and that study that you that you heard about this morning or that they did, was, was the person, their teacher or parent, uh, or was it somebody random? No, I mean, it, well, one of them was a teacher, mm-hmm. and I think the other one was a just different teacher. So what's so great is most every single student in her classroom, because I asked this, I said, who are they spelling with? And she's like, different people. Sometimes it's a sibling, it's a parent, it's one of us, it's a communication regulation partner who works at this clinic or the school. Um, so that's great because they're working with all different people so they can replicate this regardless of who the communication regulation partner is in the room. That doesn't matter. Um, yeah, so it's really fascinating because what we've been doing to this point is having our partition between a speller and, and whoever they're telepathic with. Um, which a speller just is a catch-all term for. Yeah. So the the non-speaking individuals who, again, have 
the, the families and those who love non-speakers are often reporting not just telepathy, but other spiritual gifts. And um, and so many of these non-speaking individuals, the doctors tell the families when they're little, you know, they'll never speak. They all won't be smart above a three or four year old, you know, like level. Um, they kind of take away all hope. And there's often the sense that this individual's locked inside. Well, what's happened is that some families, <laughs> um, thank God, like take a chance and, and, and you know, or try to get their child unlocked by teaching them this technique called, uh, with a casual term, a spelling, which is pointing to letters on a letter board. There's different t types of methods. There's rapid prompting method. There's spelling to communicate. There's the speller's method. This is a catch-all we've been saying. Yeah. It's just the speller's method. And what's remarkable is once the individual starts spelling, it takes a lot of time because you have to learn that um, the individuals who have this telepathic gift have usually something called apraxia, which is a mind-body disconnect. So you're trying to control your body. You have to learn the motor planning just to point. It can take a long time. But And once they are pointing and spelling things, it can take a long time to get something out. But it's often quite profound and beautiful and so so magical to so many of these families is it's information that they the family themselves didn't know. Um, uh, it could be the individual diagnosing themselves, you know, what they need. It could be some anything, any interest that maybe the parents didn't know. They're one of the young individuals in the telepathy tapes is named Houston. And when he first started spelling, he recited the Gettysburg Address. And his mom was like, what is happening right now? Um, Natalia, who's in our studio actually right now, she's become a great friend and her sister's a non-speaker and they're in, in the movie, but she's in LA right now. You know, she has a story about her sister recommending an herb to treat something that was going on in Natalia's body that turned out to be an herb Natalia didn't know about, but it was exactly what she needed to heal. And so anyway, so spelling has become a way to unlock these individuals. And as almost every family I've met has said, is like the, the, the telepathy, the sense that something is going on, the mind reading has been there all along, but spelling gives you a way to validate it. 